So my question to you is, what gave you the delusion or the the idea? And it's come true, but like, what even made you think you could become famous? Oh, me? Yeah. I got balls of steel. I'll do anything. Oh, I know I'm going to get famous. I already know that. So when you ask why, I just, I just know I will. All right. Welcome to the Tom Ward Show. Today we've got maybe the most requested guest, at least I've had in the last couple of months, Jimmy <laughs> Lee, a.k.a. the Jersey Outlaw, a.k.a. Dr. James Weiner. Hello. Hey, Tom. How are you, buddy? I'm good, man. I saw you on uh, Howie this week. Howie Mandel, yep. the great, my bald brother. You yes. You are awesome. Now, oh, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> who was on, which one of your alter egos was on the show? Were we talking to Dr. James Weiner? Uh, I think you were talking to Jimmy Lee. It was, we it were was talking to Jimmy Lee was, on that one? Yeah, I don't think it was Dr. James Weiner. It was Jimmy Lee, to be honest. I would, yeah. like, to, I would like to talk to the doctor for a little bit, and then we could go to Jersey Outlaw and Jimmy. Okay. Because hold, I on, really... hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, good. Okay, we're good. Okay. Because I relate a lot to your story. I do a lot of homework. So I, you know, I checked up on you. I watch interviews you've done and stuff. I did the same thing. I'm an older guy who was not happy with his job and kind of wasn't fulfilling me. And I decided to, at <laughs> late in life to kind of make a career shift. Um, and you okay. did a similar thing. But you didn't start out with I'm comedy. I'm still in it, though. I'm still in it, though. I didn't switch and get out. I'm doing two oh, things. Correct, correct. But you're right, like, right. The comedy is now successful, but you started out with music, right? I did music, but I just didn't get anywhere with it. I liked it, and we wrote good songs. We had a Grammy producer, but we just didn't vibe it enough to get anywhere. So we tried comedy, and the stupid thing hit. So I don't understand why, but it seemed to, to work. Not doing stand up in clubs doing street comedy now. So when are we talking here? When did you start? Cause I'm trying to, I want to see how long so I started you, comedy. I started music. I've been doing entertainment since I've been like 10, but I started the music officially in Oh four. And I stopped in like 12 and I started comedy in 13. So I've been in comedy 10 years. Wow. Okay. How, how old are you now? How old were you when you started this? Mid fifties, but you can't tell Ethan. Wait, wait, what do you mean he, mid 50s? He wants to know my that's age. A, and he gets that's a direct time. question. What is your age? Mid 50s. Don't answer. Why don't you answer that? I'm I'm 45. <laughs> I mean, I, what is what because is. you got more out of you got more out of me than Ethan. That's why I'm laughing. Mid 50s. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. You okay? I you got me laugh when I was drinking my water. <laughs> <clears throat> so we'll say <clears throat> I guess we're gonna stay with mid 50s. So you're mid 40s when you started this entertainment, you know, music. No, no, I, I was in my third, I was in my maybe late thirties and then my mid forties when I started comedy. Oh, okay. um, <clears throat> I did stand up comedy for about four years. And towards the tail end of that, I started doing street comedy and I did a, a, a reel in South beach and it got like 270,000 views. And I said, I think this is going to work. And I, Stand up would get not very many views, and it wasn't as crazy and fun and nutty. So the street comedy kind of, I realized, hey, I want to try this, and I've been doing it for like seven years. Wow! So that's kind of how that came about. What kind of material were you doing when you? I mean, stand up is, I think, the hardest so when thing I did to do. Stand up, I I did more uh, an old school style. You know, uh, Alan Rossi were comedians. My parents knew, but I was friendly with Steve. And um, I, I did some of his jokes and some of Rodney Dangerfield jokes, and I wrote some of my own jokes. And it was more a lot of one-liners and more uh, comedy for middle-aged people that, you know, are my age or even older. Um, and then when I went on the street, I became a little bit more politically incorrect, a little bit more insulting, and a little bit more nutty. But that's, Tom, what picked up the steam and got me got me known, not, not doing stand-up. Sure. Well, you know, it's – and now – you're huge. You just got a million followers, right? Correct. I saw that somewhere. Yeah. We've been, we've been working so hard with Instagram and we have a lot of social media people on our team. I have two people that work full time and I have a slew of them in LA and New York that go with me when I go out on the street and film and we put up a lot of content on social media. So we're always out there. And as we're out there more, we're more known and we're getting more viral and more known. So it's, it's just treating it like a job. Am I making money, Tom? No. Am I doing what I enjoy? Yes. And, and like you said, as you get older, 
you want to start to do things that make you feel good inside. I, I'm not doing it for money. My other job I'm doing for money. Is my much, heart in it as it was? Not really. How much is, does all of this cost? The social media guys, they're not. Um, have one. Well, uh, Ethan was giving me a hard time. Ethan was giving me a hard time because <laughs> I don't pay my people. They just find me and they want to hang with me and film with me. And I take everybody out to eat. I'm just nice and you know, I'm a Wait, good person. And, and that's what I do. That's, that's it right there. But the two post-production people, uh, Mason and his wife that work full time, they're paid. But they're working every day. They're giving me content to put up every day. They're editing videos. They're doing everything. They work like full time for me almost. Wow. And you mentioned Ethan a couple yeah. times. I'm new. Mm -hmm. I'm not part of the H3 universe. Or oh, you're not. You're York. not part of H3. No, I never listened to the show. Still, even oh, you now, got a, you got a vibe I, with Ethan. Well, I went on the show. Um, oh, you went on. It was a long story, but Ethan was tearing me apart <laughs> out of nowhere. Why? Why? Well. I, it, this is about you, but he he saw one of my interviews with this guy, Jason Nash, and he was commenting on something Jason said. And then he's like, I've been looking at this guy, Tom, for a while. How the fuck is he getting all these guests? He's got a small channel. He's writing for Forbes. There's money exchanging hands. He's he's paying them or they're paying they, for they, Forbes they articles. Payola. He thought yeah. it was payola. Yeah, yeah. Then he's just like tearing me apart for getting good guests but getting shitty views. So I'm sitting there like, like my wife's cousin. He's picking on me. you, basically. He's Huge. picking on you. So anyway, yeah. I ended up going, long story longer, I go on the show, defend myself, and kind of turn right. the whole thing around. But now I got a ton of the H3 community to come over, and they've been unbelievable. You so you got their fans. They're unreal. And you yeah. are huge with that community. I'm huge with H3, yeah. I thought this happened recently. Like all of a sudden they found you, but I was looking. No, no. They Ten years about ago, you. I started with them. How did you guys connect with each other? So what happened was, Ethan, I'll tell you the story. What happened was somebody sent in something to Ethan that I gave out some of my music uh, CDs. And I did this uh, a spoof video called One Fucked Up Dennis. It was stupid. I was done as a spoof. So Ethan couldn't stop laughing. And he, he did a reaction video called One Freaked Up Dennis. And that was like maybe eight years ago. And that was the beginning of meeting him. And then I contacted him and then they met me in New York and we did a video in, a year later. And um, we've kept in touch. And as the years are going by, we've grown together. And, you know, now I'm almost like a fixture with them. And I appreciate everything they do because they've gotten me known. I'm a small guy, but they're getting me known. And then Ethan was nice enough to to ask Howie to have me on him because Howie thinks the world of Ethan, he put me on. So, you know, you got to have the right relationships with the right people. You got to be nice to people. So they do want to help you. For sure. You know? and I, I watched yeah. that video too. The, <laughs> the fucked up Dennis one. one. And, oh, you watched it. <laughs> yeah. So like, I'm looking at that and really they're kind of ragging on you. And at one point he says, it's just as bad as it gets. It's just the worst. Yeah, she did say that. <laughs> right? yeah but you know what? They, they, even though even that was bad, they vibed it and they couldn't stop. And then Ethan asked me to do another one and he reacted on it. And about a year or two later, I think it was 2016, I wrote another, you know, I wrote the script and I, I, I cast this time more actors and actresses and characters and comedians where the first one I just winged it and had my staff. So the second one was a little better. So that, that was it. But then it messed up my career a little bit with uh, staffing issues and patience because they don't realize it's a character and it's a fun. They actually take you serious because uh, this is how people are. They're not, they're not smart. They, they really think that's how you are. And then they don't want to use you or people don't want to work for you. So I had to shelf that because I have a, a company where I own multiple locations and uh, stick to the street comedy. So that's kind of what happened with the one F'd up dentist stuff, you know, being, being honest. Well, it's funny. You say that, Jimmy, you're going to be impressed with me now because I do my homework. Why? So yeah. I, I thought about that a lot. I'm thinking like I saw the video. And Did I'm that happen like, to you with your job? Almost. Oh, they found out and it was not good. Yeah, yeah. Like, and what, they let you go or say you got to do one or the other? No, but I had to talk to my boss and, you know, he, I had to assure him that like it was a problem. Still, yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you still getting your work done? How do I know you're not cutting out in the middle of the day to do interviews, all this other yeah. stuff? So it was right. a giant headache. But for you, it's different because – you've got a business the public goes to. So I was thinking, I go, I right. wonder like if anybody writes Yelp reviews, like if anyone talks about this and 
It's funny you should ask. It's funny I should ask. I found one. Why are there some up there? Well, it was great. The, the Yelp reviews were overall outstanding, but I, I did see one that cracked me up. It said, be careful here. The dentist with the jokes, I don't know what his issue is. Maybe he's too busy to become a comedian, trying to become a comedian. Oh, somebody wrote that in a Yelp? <laughs> in the Yelp <laughs> review of your office. And I was That's thinking funny. like, what do you have to keep that world separate? Because I heard you on Ethan saying like you used to give out your music to patients and stuff too. Like how do they? Yeah. So what I do, what I do now is as I'm becoming a little more seasoned with this career, I don't know if you call it a career, it's not making any money, but (laughs) job, career, fun thing, passion. I'm learning, try to separate more. And you know, when I'm in my office, focus on my job, my patients and I have staff to run and I have to have meetings with managers and I have to do a lot of administrative stuff and you do have to put the other hat on and, you know, uh, it's a different person, you know, it's a business person and a dentist. It's sure. different than when I got on the street with the leather coat and I say to the lady, you're fat, you know what I mean? Or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? You got to stop eating. You know, you told me you were to stop eating and now you're expanding. You know, you, you can't do that in the dental office, but you know, it's, it's like almost Clark Kent and Superman, two, two different characters. Well, let's hear more. Let's hear some jokes, man. We, we heard from Dr. Wiener for shit, 11 minutes. If people are still watching. Right. So if people who don't, if people are still comedy, watching, did they leave, did they leave already? I, I find this interesting. I hope, hopefully other people do. So but give us an example of the jokes for people who aren't familiar with your comedy, the street stuff. You so do. I do stereotypic you know, insult style humor. So if you're a black guy, I'm going to ask you how long you've been black. And if you're a dark skinned black guy, I'm going to say, I've seen a lot of black people, but so you're overdoing it, you know, something like that. If you're Chinese, I'm going to say no starch on the collar, please. We talked about this before. Uh, uh, and by the way, do you have any duck sauce? So it's very stereotypic humor. If you're uh, Japanese and you're, you know, you have large breasts, I'm going to say it's quite a set of Tanakas you got there. But you don't mind me saying so. Uh, when you ask permission to insult someone, it's funny. So I walk up to a girl and I say, may I say something? And the girl goes, sure. And you, and you go, I got, you got to be one of the ugliest broads I've ever seen. Now, if your face was on a building, it would be condemned and you walk away. So when you ask permission, it makes it funny. So I can vibe a, a situation and look at the people. First of all, I can figure whether I'm going to be able to hit them and they're going to like it. If they look, no, I won't go. But then I have to figure out what to say. The best one I did, um, are you able to go on the Instagram do you have access um, to my Instagram where you can post, show something really funny? Because it's hysterical. Now, but I'll just, and I can cool set it up. But this is probably, can you do it on your phone? Or you Let want me, me to? So if you go to my Instagram, there's a guy. I'll tell you if you can find it. But this this is the beauty of what I do. This is this is it in about a 40-second video. Mm-hmm. Do you see uh, my, it, my What's Instagram your Instagram? I, I, Jersey Outlaw? Uh, the Jersey Outlaw. The Jersey Outlaw. Okay. Damn, a million followers. You're followed now. So what am I looking right. for? So now scroll down into the videos and look for a video of a guy wearing a purple shirt and he has gray hair. And, and, Got uh, it. I'll, I'll, yeah, but it's a video, not the pictures. Is it a video? Yep. Right. So now will you be able to, before you play it and I tell the, the, the viewers, no, shut it, shut it off. I want to set it up. Yep. I want to set it up. Will people be able to hear that if you put it up there or no? You know what we're going to do? Insert what? Tilly, insert clip here. That we're gonna put we're gonna stop this right now. We're gonna insert right. the clip so people will see it. Okay. And now we came out of the clip. Explain to me or set it up first and then we'll show the All clip. right. So what happened was there's a guy this this just shows the beauty of what I do and how quick I think. So the guy's name's Peter Marco and uh, he owns a jewelry store and he's sitting and I've met him before, but I don't know him. And he's well off. So I started started ripping into him and uh I, I just, you have to watch the clip. I don't want to explain it. It's just funny. And probably part of it's true. Tilly, insert clip here, actually. Not where I asked for it before. Right. Yeah. This is the guy who people come to when you're lonely. And a husband has died. And they're worth about $20 million, And they beg Peter to hang out. And once they spend about $200,000 one shot, he goes buy some lunch. And he takes him to in and out burger because he's a little tight around the ankle. This is why he drives a Rolls Royce. And he has a big house in Beverly Hills. It's gated. And he has two Jews in the front. And so you can't come in. And, and when <laughs> they have the a guy. So has that gotten you in any shit? I mean, have people like physically so, assaulted you? No, or what? people sometimes get, get steamed up. I'm not going to tell you they don't. And, you know, but we have, you know, well, when we're shooting on the street with social media people, we don't have any security guards. We just shoot casually and we have two or three people doing 
you know, filming uh, on phones or smaller cameras for social media. But when we do our big shoot, which we did a week ago in L.A., there's a limousine, there's two guards, there's two cameras and three social media people. There's like a whole production. So like tour buses are pulling over. I'm going on tour buses insulting people. I'm walking into Pink's. The owner comes. He buys us lunch. I'm working the crowd line. And there's a whole different vibe when the full production crew's in gear. And I can, you know, get away with a little bit more, too, because they see that. And they and they know. And there's a lot of people in L.A. that know me now. I'm very, very well known more out there. A little bit in New York, definitely not where I live. But I'm getting more known just from going out and, and doing this. I'm, I'm a guy on the hustle to get famous. And I do street performing. And I love to be around people. And I just want to be loved, you know. I don't think I got that growing up with my parents and I'm not doing it for money. I'm doing it cause it's in my heart just to go out and have fun. Now you've said, I've, I, you've said this numerous times in different places. You have this void to be famous and known. And mm-hmm. when you were talking, I heard you talking about your music career before, which didn't take right. off, but you were talking about that and you weren't mad that the music didn't take off. You were mad that you didn't become famous from it. That's a different thing. Yeah. Oh man, I didn't get known. I just really yeah. want to be known and noticed. So, and I said to Howie Mandel and he, he looked at me funny and he said, don't, don't do what you're doing for fame. Do it because you like it because fame is fleeting. And he said, when you're dead, no one will remember you. And he quite didn't understand why do I want to be famous? He did, and most people don't, but I think unless if you went through what I went through and people have, then they may understand better, you know? Well- what happened that made you seek fame? I think how I grew up was in a a dysfunctional family where my mom was bipolar and mentally ill and my dad took care of my mom. So my brother and I really, we didn't have the love we needed as a child. And I left home empty. And, um, you know, since I was young, I always wanted to be a celebrity and be known and be noticed. And I'm older now, Tom, and I, and I still want to be noticed probably more because my life is getting, you know, as you get older, you have less time and more money. So now I'm middle-aged and I, I want to do it more and I want it to happen quicker because, you know, I'm older. No, I understand. I don't know if that's your situation or your motive for what you're doing, but my motive is I feel good when I go out and I go into a restaurant. People know who I am. And my wife's like, you'll go eat there even if the food isn't good as long as they t- talk to you and they, they tell you they love you, which is partially true. Well, so we eat in this place. I, and, and, go ahead. Where's the love of the game? Because the reason I started doing this wasn't to become famous. I'm from New Jersey. I'm from South Jersey. I'm a fellow South Jersey guy. Me too. Me too. I didn't know anyone in Hollywood. I didn't know anybody in showbiz. So the idea of me becoming famous was not even a thought. What made you do this? What made you do this? It was kind of out of necessity. I was writing. Mm. I got a side gig at Forbes, kind of writing a couple articles a month for Forbes. It's a long story how I got there. I started doing that on the side. And I'd have So you were a writer. Yeah. You became a writer. Yep. I became a writer and then, you know, while doing a sales job and then I started, you know, writing the articles, but I would have an hour conversation with somebody famous or somebody interesting. And I would only share an 800 word article. I'm like, that is such a waste of an hour. So I went to, yeah, you don't show anything that you did. You need to have the interview like this where you can learn a lot. I agree. So is that how you got into doing this? So Mm. I I asked Forbes, I go, Forbes, you guys got to shoot this. Like, you, there's, you can get social media clips. You can do all this. And they said, no. So I said, fuck you. I'll pay for it myself and do it. So for me, it was oh. a love of the game first. You did it because it was in your heart and the company wouldn't let you do it. Now that may or may not be a good idea because it's cost me a ton of time and money. And yeah. Have you, you made money? Views. Have you made money at this time or no? Overall? No, it's been a loss. No. So welcome to my world. Yeah. yeah welcome yeah. to my world. <laughs> yeah. Well, how do you support yourself? Do you have another job or are you independently wealthy? It's a, it, no, I wish I was. No, it's a long story. No. But, um, I had normal sales jobs for like 20 years and I started to make money at YouTube and stuff. I've been doing this for like six years and I saved all that brand deal money and stuff and put it aside because I'm like, one day I just want to take a year and go all in. So and, you're smart. You put your money when you're frugal. Yeah. Well, I'm not even frugal. I just, I made a budget and I didn't want to touch your savings Talk or anything. I'm like, this is all free money anyway. It's just brand deal money and YouTube revenue and stuff. So right. it's kind of the house's money. Like, let's go a year and go, let's give it a shot. I see. And here we are. <laughs> when I'm looking for so jobs. What, 
So let me ask you this. It, it, it's been a year. Yeah, yeah. What's what's the outcome for you? What's happening? Is it working? Is it not working? It's funny. It was dead until I went on the H3 podcast. And then overnight, mm. I got an instant audience who cared about me, not just the person I was interviewing. So that was a game changer for sure. So H3 launched you kind of similar to me in a way. I, I, exactly. I can relate to your story a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But... Mm. Back to you, enough of me. Right? That you, this is, no, this it's just is interesting because there's parallels here. You're doing a different product than me, but it's the same sure. almost metric. Like you had another job, you didn't like it, you're doing this. Almost yeah. the same thing, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Oh, South Jersey guys, you know? Yeah. Where are you from? You said Medford? Yeah, a little town outside of Medford called Chemung, New Jersey. Yeah, a little yeah. I know. I'm in Voorhees, so I know where you're at. Where are you at? Yeah. Originally down by Atlantic City, a place called Margate. Now I'm in Voorhees. I, listen, I used to go to Ocean City. I know exactly where Margate is. Yeah. yeah so you know the shore. Of course. I know the whole deal. So back to yeah. the, your like philosophy, coming where we come from, there's nobody famous. There's nobody who works in Hollywood. Yeah, there's no vibe here for, for what I do. I have to go to New York like every week and vibe up. Yeah. And I'm going to L.A. like four times a year. I used to go once a year. There's no vibe here. Nobody knows me here. I'll get lucky if somebody here and there knows me. There's no vibe for entertainment here. So my question to you is, what gave you the delusion or the the idea, and it's come true, but like, what even made you think you could become famous? Oh, me? Yeah. I got balls of steel. I'll do anything. Oh, I know I'm going to get famous. I already know that. So when you ask why, I just, I just know I will. So um, I have a way to go out and uh, I can walk into... I'll tell you a story last night. That'll blow you away. We're at Cipriani's last night, and I go to the bathroom, and there's a guy in the bathroom. And he goes, hey, how you doing? I said, you know who hangs out in the men's room, all the dicks. So I get the guy start laughing. And I go, oh, you know about my ass doctor, Dr. Bendover? I said, then what's up with these brown fingernails? So I'm ripping him up. The guy is absolutely, he's peeing, laughing while he's peeing. He comes out, he goes, where are you sitting? He walks, he goes, milk, get them dessert, get them a drink, two seconds, the fucking guy knows I'm famous. He wants to buy me shit. I have something. I have a gift. And uh, Elvis's mother in that Elvis movie uh, said to Elvis, they were in the house, and, and she said, uh, Elvis, you have a gift, and you have to have the whole world know about that gift and share that. And I feel I have this kind of charisma and vibe when people meet. I got social media people wanting to come out and hang out with me free. They just want to hang out with me. They want to. They have normal, boring lives. They want to go on the street. They want to see me insult people. They want to film. They want to have dinner. They want everybody to pay attention to them. I have this fucking vibe. And, mm -hmm. and I know I have it. And people love me. And, I, and that's what I enjoy doing. You know, if I'm drilling a tooth or talking to a dentist to produce more or doing uh, end-of-the-day paperwork, that's not very exciting anymore. It's a job. Sure. It makes money. But at time, it isn't very exciting. I can do it. I'm good at it. It's not where my heart is. You know, I'm, I'm just yeah. being honest. So I, you, you asked me that question. It's like I know if I keep going – that I will get famous. I'm already vibing. I mean, who the hell ever thought I'd get on Howie Mandel? I never thought in a million years I would get on Howie Mandel. Um, you're nice enough to have me on. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm just going to keep going and going. I don't know where I'm going to end up, but I know if I keep going out and doing what I'm doing and getting more known, I enjoy it. I have fun with it. And and I'm and it's a journey, and it's fun because you don't never know each day when you go what's going to happen. You know, and that's kind of – that's where my – that's how I'm feeling about it. I don't feel bad. I just feel happy when I'm out. I went to uh, New York yesterday um, because they have the uh, Italian Festival in Little Italy. We were just vibing there. A lot of people recognize me from H3 there. We went to Cipriani's for dinner. went to Balazar for lunch. The waitresses all come over. They need to have jokes. I'm tapping one on the right shoulder when I'm on the left-hand side. I'm just fucking around with them. They love me, you know? So that's what I like doing. I like yeah. being a big ham. That's really, that's all I am. I don't mean no harm. I do make sure the jokes are politically incorrect. So people, they go, what? It's like shock comedy. I don't tell them I'm going to insult them. I just do it. So it, it gets that reaction from them. And, you know, sometimes you do miss and someone gets mad, but most of the time you hit. Now, I'm a huge Howard Stern guy. I grew up listening to him since I was like 10 right. years old. But he always says something. Mm. He says there's a hole inside him that can only be filled by like, adoration and people the public loving him that's the only thing that can fill that and he goes so, 
he has what I have then. He has the same thing I have, except he got really famous. I'm not well, really you're on famous, your way. But, yeah, but that's basically how I feel. And um, I think that's because how his dad treated him. If you watch that movie, his dad was not very nice to him. And the average Stern, I think, deep down is a nice person. For sure. Um, And I think he has a void because he was a dorky kid. He probably didn't get chicks growing up. And he became famous, and now he, like, owns the world. And um, he said something really funny. He said when he was on NBC, there was a real famous radio guy who was mean to him, Don Emus or Don oh, Imus. Oh, Don Imus, yeah, he was a dick. Don Imus. And, and he left NBC, and he said uh, NBC was the happening place. And when I left, I said, oh, my career, I screwed up. He didn't realize he was the one happening, not NBC. He realized it by accident. So I think he was on this journey. And as he went, he realized it was the reason was him. That, that people were vibing, not because of the place he worked for. So he's very much um, like me in that he has that, that he needs that love from people because he didn't get, his dad was not nice. I don't remember him saying much about his mom. I do remember them saying that they did send him to school for radio because he wanted to do that, but their father wasn't happy to do it, but he did it. So I don't think he had nice parents. Similar with David Copperfield, if you go to his show in Vegas, um, he had videos and me and my wife were looking and we said, Lynn, look at that, how mean his mother was to him, where he would go to New York, he was from Island, and he would just escape in magic and do magic tricks on the street because his mom was mean. So these are a lot of Jewish people like myself that really have dysfunctional families where parents either don't have time for them or they're not nice and they have such a big void to be loved and noticed that they'll do almost anything to do it. And a lot of them don't do it for money, but they do end up getting lucky and then getting famous and making money. But I see a common pattern. I don't think I'm the only one. You know what I mean? Every entertainer has it. And the other thing Howard says too is right. it's never satisfied. It always wants more. And it and That's true. You have it's like filled, a drug. Right? Yeah, it's one like a day drug. doesn't take care of me. He needs to fix the next day and the next day and the next day. Right. Is that the same and thing it's better you? And it's better time than sex. And, and go into a good restaurant to eat. I told my wife that, and I told people that. When you when I have Getty people, when I was at Pink's last Saturday getting pictures, and the next day they're in Getty, there's no better high than that. I can't even go to the Polo Lounge or the Beverly Hills Hotel and beat that. So what you're saying about Stern's right, and I'm, I'm experiencing that, and it's exactly right what he said. Exactly. You, you know, and I heard you, people wanted to know, people had a ton of questions for you too. They asked me about, um, they're like, ask them about histrionic personality disorder. I'm like, first of all, what the fuck is that? I have men, so, I'm bipolar too. And I have mental I'm issues. Bipolar. I've never heard of it, but hold on. So I looked so, it up. I, I go, oh, I looked, looked it, up, it up and it yeah. says, it's you. For people with histrionic personality disorder, their self-esteem depends on the approval of others and does not arise from a true feeling of self-worth. They have an overwhelming yeah. desire to be noticed and often behave dramatically or inappropriately to get attention. Who is that? That, that That's the kid. That's me. For sure. And it's interesting because another characteristic is they, they feel they're closer to people than they really are. So after 10 minutes on the podcast, I was calling Howie family. He goes, Jim, I've known you 10 minutes. So I have a commonality to want to be family with people because I didn't come from a good family. Like my wife's family's treated me so nice and I'm always so appreciative. And they're really my family, not my family of origin because they weren't nice. And my brother wasn't a nice guy to me. So I have I have to call everybody like family. Like I was Uncle Outlaw and he was Uncle Howie on the podcast. Yeah, I saw that. So that that is what I have. And by the way, my son diagnosed me with that. No way. He, he figured it out because he was a psychology minor at NYU and he ah. figured that out. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that leads me. I'm glad you that mentioned definitely so Tom is me. For sure. I mean, I, I read that. I'm like, that's him. But so exactly the, the other thing I know, I have kids now, no matter what I do or anything, when I'm home, I'm not the star of the show. The kids are like, and I realize that like, they don't care that I was at Paris Hilton's they house today really interviewing have, her. Right. They don't, they, they're the star and that's the way it should be. Right. And no matter how famous you are, the kids should still be the star. And I I'm striving to get, get to that area, Tom, a little better, to be honest. How's it been? I, I need a little work in that. I need a little work in that. Uh, and I have to be more aware and I'm going to do that for my wife and my kids. I'm going to do have that. Have you struggled with that? Like, yeah, it's hard because like, uh, yeah, like when I'm with the kids and like, you know, they're at an event or something. I start doing jokes. I'm like, it's about them, Jim. No Jimmy Lee. So like uh, I have to kind of 
be aware of that. And sometimes I, I just jump through and I don't think. So that's a problem I have. And that's my problem. And I have to work through that. Yeah. So do you have that problem? Or are you okay? No, I'm okay with that. Well, one, cause I'm not famous. I really have that to fuck with, but, but you're more the interviewing guy. So it's a little yeah, different. I'm not the guy mm-hmm. on the street, you you're know, with the, a camera. Guy, right. Yeah. So it's not, right. it doesn't really apply to me as much, but right, right, right. I get to do cool shit. I get to hang out with some cool people sometimes and stuff. And, but my right. kids, my kids put me in check and my wife too. She's like, she doesn't give a fuck. She doesn't watch my videos. My kids don't give a fuck my, unless my, I have my a present. Watch it either. You're right. No. They don't care. But that's the way it should and I got to get that through my head. And I've yeah. got, you know, when, it, you know, when I, I, I kind of accepted it when I went to California, some of the people in entertainment were telling me, I thought if it was Harry Mandel. Well, Ethan's different because of hell but somebody was telling me and vibing with me and said, you know, your family, they're normal. This is not a normal job that you do. They're not really interested in it. When you're around them, talk about them. It's not about you. And, that, and it kind of hit because I do do that wrong. And I, and I was telling my wife that I have to really try to improve that. Tom, and I'm going to try to improve that because uh, other people have that same problem. It isn't just me no. that has that problem. Yeah. People that not even in entertainment. I mean, we've all been to parties where it's like somebody's rambling and they're like, are they ever going to ask about me? They've been talking about themselves for right, right, fucking right. minutes. Hello. You know, yeah. you know, yeah. Tune into the crowd, right? You know, right. but yeah. that's true. How do you snap yourself out of it? When do you catch yourself or do you uh, just realize when it's too I'll late? I'll catch myself or, or, or someone will tell me mm-hmm. normally Lynn. And, uh, you know, I'm going to be like more aware of it now, especially since I went to L.A. last week and a couple of people told me they have that similar situation. So I didn't feel stupid about it. I just feel I have to be aware of it. And I think what's interesting in the job, not my dental job, that's the normal job and the entertainment job. It's not normal. And the people I deal with are all not normal. But then my family's normal. My dentist job's normal. My dentists are normal. And it's a little hard to turn the faucet from one way to another when you really love being the entertainer more. And it's not that easy to do, but that's something I got to work on, So, you know, which, which I will. So, okay, your professional life, right? And I've been there. I know exactly how you feel. So yeah. you've got a staff. You've got four offices. You've got to sit down with the accountant right. and go over your financials. You've I've got a controller. Sit- we go over budget. I have to talk like a business administrator, which I, I'm good at. There's Operations, training. There's managing. People, everything. Yeah, it's yeah. a lot of work. So how do you get through all that? Finally, I just had enough. I snapped. I'm like, fuck this. <laughs> I'm, I'm, well, I'm Tom, here. Tom, you want to hear? Tom, you want to hear? You want to hear an effed up story? Yeah. This you'll like this story. Last year, in the, in February, I had to cover one of the other locations. So now I'm a dentist, two days in Audubon, and I'm not having any time to do administrative. I'm I'm working in the Hadfield location because I don't have a dentist. So now I'm doing all this administration. I do all this paperwork at night, like two, three hours a night of paperwork for all the clothes out to the control in the morning knows. So I know because I have to have managers meetings early driving in. To, so I have to know what happened the day before. So I'm now working two days in Audubon, two and a half days in the Hadfield. So I'm working full time as a dentist. So I work on a Monday. This is a funny story. It proves what you said. I'm working on a Monday and everything's just going wrong. So I, I didn't get mad. I went in the back. It was about 1130. Now, this is a Monday. And I called, I called, I believe, Amex. And I said, I want to book a trip tonight on a, on a night flight Monday, and I want to come back Saturday. So they said they have the flight. It leaves 8 o'clock. Blah, blah, blah. So I said, well, hold on. I got on the other phone. I called the limo company. I said, can you pick me up my house at 5? They said, yes. I said, be in my house at five. Hung up. I told Amex, just book the trip. Told my staff an emergency came up. I'm going to work the morning, eat lunch, go home at two. Embarrassed to tell my wife, Tom, anything. I very (laughs) quietly packed my suitcase. Thank God no one's home. The core picks me up at five. No one knows. I'm at the airport eating dinner at seven, and I'm embarrassed. I call my wife. I go, Lynn, she goes, where are you? I go, we got a little problem here, Lynn. And uh, she said, what well, I said, I'm, I'm losing, I'm losing it with the work schedule. I'm at the airport going to LA five days. She goes, go have fun. She didn't even get mad. I think that's she kind of knew. That's not exactly the situation that you're talking about. That's I never do that. Life. I always plan trips. I just blew. I blew. I blew a gasket. So what's the end game here? I mean, Dennis, my, my wife my, has two cousins who are dentists. I kind of have an idea of, you know, what, what they, what they so, make. It's a good gig. Like, do you want to sell the no, offices I, or? 
no, I, I have a son. I have two sons. Mm-hmm. And one son's already in dental school. So I oh, told nice. him, and, you know, the kids, we're going to force ourselves to hang in here. And when he gets out, we're going to give him the keys to the store. No charge. I'm going to call you, Tom, see if you need an assistant for your show <laughs> and pick you up in the rolls. And we're going to hang out with Howie Mandel. That's going to be it. You're so like I'm hanging the, in for them to give them the business. You're like the worst salesperson to be a dentist ever. Like you, we've just talked. Like, you know what, Tom? No, but Tom, when I'm working, yeah. here's the sad part. Sure. If you came to me as a dentist and saw the type of work I do and how good I am yeah. and how exact I am at being a dentist, you'd come to me. And I'm okay. real serious and my work's beautiful. My crowns fit. They don't have to be adjusted most of the time. My dentures are gorgeous. They fit. They stay in. I'm really good at this job and I'm a good business guy. The problem is, is I've grown tired of it, but when I'm working, I'm doing it correctly because I'm a Mitch. I'm not going to be an idiot and not do a good job on you. If you pay me money, yeah. I'm still going to continue to perform and be professional and do my job and do my business work and do things right. Cause that's me and make money too. At the same time, not the money I was making, but, but I'm not saying it's where I'm, my heart is, but I'm not going to do it wrong. Sure. So that's the sad part of it. What, you know, made that's, your, that's the, what made your son want to become a dentist after it sounds like we've been talking about how much you are well, here's doing Tom, to be a dentist? Well, here's Tom what happened when the kids were young. You know, I did kind of what my mom and dad did. They said, you're going to be doctors. And I said, guys, I, I one time had had five locations, you know, and I said, I have a nice company. It's probably going to grow more. You guys go. And I said, one of you guys will be more like a clinical director. And one guy will do the business end. Like kind of Walt Disney, Roy Disney, you know, you have partners like that. Well, COVID comes and, you know, it destroys the revenue, the staffing issues. I lose some dentists. It's not doing that good anymore. It was doing good. It was real good till COVID. So that's what happened. But, you know, the kid, the kid went to college. He's smart. He got a very high cum. He got into down. He got into six schools. He's going to a school and I'm going to be there for him and help him and take care of him. And, and the young one too, he's pre-dental now too in college. Wow. So I'm going to be, be the guy I have to be. Nice. You know, but I'm going to continue, Tom, doing what I want to do also. Fuck yeah. I'm not giving up that. Hell no, uh, nor should you. Up. No. Right, because then, then I will, Tom, kill myself. <laughs> well, you're you know what I mean? it. Well, it's funny. Yeah. We, we talked about that first video, right, where Ethan and Hila are kind of, you know, ragging on you. You have the last right. laugh because I look, that video has 3.5 million views. Is that the you one know, freaked up that? Yeah, that has yeah, three views, and a yeah. half million views. So I'm just thinking like, Man, this worked out perfect and continues to pay by, off. by accident. By accident, yeah. Yeah, you they, they I owe them everything. They're the ones that kind of really launched me, Ethan Hiller, to be honest. What else have they done for you? Does Ethan and you know taking you to the side and give you advice on what you should be doing in comedy? No, no, no. They have they have me on yeah. and they tell me, you know, you're gonna be James Weiner, you're gonna be normal and co host, and I you know you do what they ask you to do because they let you come on and they they treat you nice and they do nice things for you and I try to do nice things for them. I just got them Carrot Top on their <laughs> show. Carrot Top's going to be on. I, I run into him a lot at my hotel. And um, he just did Howie's podcast. And I, I was calling Zach. And Zach asked Ethan. And Carrot Top's going to be on. That that was me who orchestrated that. Oh, wow. So, yeah. What's it like working with somebody else? Like a, a bigger star, right? What's that, what's that like? Do you just look at like you're part of the team? Yeah, I don't like if I'm with Ethan and Hill, they're huge. I'm a, I'm a small guy climbing. Yeah. And I'm happy. I'm happy that they think enough of me to have me on and I'm appreciative. And, you know, I'm going to try to keep climbing and be out there and do what I got to do. But there's always going to be Tom, somebody ahead of you. Sure. And there's going to always be somebody behind you. So, you know, you can't look at it like that. You just have to keep going and doing, doing where, where your heart t- takes you, you know, where your passion is. Well, I think you're, you're an inspirational story because. You know, I've interviewed hundreds of successful people, right? And the right. worst ones are the ones who are like, especially like like young TikTokers, right? They're hot. You know, they're a guy with abs. There's a girl looks good in a bikini. They make a couple of videos. Right. They blow up and they become millionaires, right? And they That's the worst story. Shit. Well, yeah, they're not humble no one anyway, can, and they really don't no have anything. But they do. Well, right. no one can relate right. to that story. It's like I didn't have abs. I wasn't super hot. I wasn't a millionaire before right. I was twenty. Like, it's so no one relatable. can relate to that. No. But people can right. relate to your story where it's like, I wasn't happy. I tried this. I failed. I tried stand up. I failed. I just decided to do street comedy. It kind of went failure. somewhere and it was like a slow it, it, progression, right? Right. 
oh, this didn't happen overnight, and it's still not at the point, Tom, where I want it. I'm being honest. Where you want it to go? I have to go every place in this country, and people have to be coming up to me constantly. I don't want to be just H3 branded. I want to be mainstream branded. When I go to a restaurant and everybody's coming up, and everybody wants to hang, and it's just a constant momentum, I'm good. That's it. But That's it. I call bullshit. It. No, you're not good. If you were, I, listen, I've been to enough therapy how, in my oh, life. That's how effed up I am. That's how effed up yeah, I am. I know because I've been in therapy for years, right? You go yeah. to the restaurant and there's 50 people there and 30 stand up and give you a fucking standing ovation. Like the Jersey Outlaws here, James Weiner, you know, right, you're going right. to go. We do about the audience. You're going to go, what's up with the 20 who aren't standing and who don't know who I am? The problem is the rest, the rest didn't know me. That that bothers me. So That's the problem. You'll never get to that point. Never be happy. Yeah. You're never going to get to that point where everyone knows you, everyone loves you. You know what I mean? Like you go out I and your mob, it's never enough. We wanted to be like the Beatles. Remember the Beatles when we were young? They got chased. They were like the hottest thing back in the 60s. Before our time, but I mean, I do remember the Beatles. Sure. Well, you know. Jimmy, I love you, but you ain't you know, John and Paul. Right. No, I know, but I'm saying I, I just need, like what you said, Stern, you said with Stern, it's, I think I'm pretty much the same as him. For almost. sure. Every entertainer has it to some degree. Yeah, they do. But Stern sounds like he really has it bad. Yep. But he's honest. like dealt with it. Like he's been, he's all fucked up. He's been in therapy for years and years and years. Oh, like, all that. Did you ever interview Stern? No, I met him once. Hold on. I have a, I have a picture. I'm such a huge fan. I don't think I've ever showed this. This is. Let me see. There you go. That is me, Howard, oh, that's you. my wife, and his wife. So, so where's that? It's at America's uh, Got Talent when he was on the show. Um, yeah. Ended up getting seats next to his wife and behind. If Ethan, if you're listening to this, you'll like the story. I'm sitting next to Ronnie, the limo driver. I'm sitting with Robbins right in front of me. So I'm like surrounded no. by this stern circle. And I was just talking to her the whole time. And there was a break. Yeah. She goes, would you want a picture with Howard? I go, fuck yeah. So there was a commercial So that was break. the wife. That was the wife that asked you. Yeah, yeah. So she brought she brought Pretty me up crazy. to meet Howard. I talked to him for two seconds and got a picture out of it. But uh, yeah, I'd mm. love to interview the guy. That's a, I mean, that's a dream for sure. Can you get big names or, or like, could you get really big people? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's like, what Ethan was, like he, that's why he, he had suspicion. He goes, what the fuck's this guy doing? Because yeah, I've, I've had incredible <laughs> okay. guests like Ciara, the singer, Paris Hilton, uh, Charlie. You Demilio, Paris Hilton. The, yeah. So I you mean, did get you've a lot of good people. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And then Ethan was suspicious of that. How's he doing? He's not that big, right? Why but, was he suspicious? <laughs> well, I mean, if you don't know me and like know kind of how I go about it, you're like, well, how does this guy with 50,000 subscribers get Paris Hilton? Yeah, how do you get people? If you're, like, how do you do that? Well, There's got to be I, magic. I said it's not, it's not magic at all. I've been in sales my whole life. It's all about giving value, right? When people, I've been oh. around celebrities enough to know, and you know, that 24 hmm. hours a day, seven days a week, for the rest of their life, they're asked for things all day long. Can you take a picture That's with true. me? Can you post a selfie with me? Can you tag my stupid clothing brand, right? Can you make a, a TikTok for my mom, it's right? Constant. Constant. All day. So you can't just say, oh, Paris, can you come on my show? Fuck no. Hmm. You have to say, Paris, I'm interested in talking to you about business. You don't get a chance to talk about business a lot. I'm also a contributor to Forbes. I'll write a Forbes article and we could shoot the video for YouTube, but I go, I'll also give you any social media clip you want it's good content for you to post. You know, so you're giving to... value. You're giving value. You're not really asking for something. You're, you're offering something of value to them. For sure. And I think that's, that's key smart. in anything you do, right? What are you mm. providing? Yeah. Like, what are you giving people? Mm. You know, you can't just mm. ask it. Shit doesn't work that way. It's same thing with sales. Like you can't just ask for a sale. Like you have to show why a your benefit. product or service benefits them. Yeah. Because they just care about themselves. Yeah. Like what's in it for me. That's true. That's we true. all think that, so right? Was it hard to get Paris Hilton? Cause she's yeah, like anybody like that takes months and months and months and managers and yeah. PR people and shit. Yeah, it takes a lot of time. And you deal with not her, her people, right? Honestly. No, I mean, sometimes you get, you exchange numbers after the interview and become close to them a little bit. Um, and half the time it just stays with the PR person, the manager, and that's fine too. Right, right, right. 
It just depends. But I admire you because you got some really big names. Oh, thank you. And that, not everybody can do that. Well, it's and then you have thing. some small people like me. <laughs> well, you're not small anymore, man. A million followers on Instagram. No, I'm starting to do good. Yeah. yeah, I'm starting to do good. And I guarantee you, watch this too. You will get way more views than the Paris Hilton interview got. Way more. Why? Well, I just Why? look 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 at you on the Howie show. I, last time I checked, it's probably off now, but it was like one thirty or something. Yeah, it was like it was over a hundred thousand. And then you look at that JoJo interview that was super controversial, where she's talking about Colleen Ballinger 40, and 40, all 000. the clips. Exactly. So, so why like, is that? People why like you. Hmm. People like you, and the let's get me on Kimmel. We gotta get on Kimmel. <laughs> I'll make it happen, man. I can make it happen. Can you get me on fucking Kimmel or Fallon? I I need late night, man. I gotta fucking take Fallon down to Cipriani's for dinner, man. Baby milk. steps. You're you're. Hey, look, you're take on the you right. Down to, you're I gotta bring right you crew. down to Craig's. You gotta come down to Craig's. Craig's is overrated. In I, fuck Craig's. I like their chicken bread. Parm. Nah. Oh, the bread's good. The bread's great. How about that chicken parm? Tom? I, I don't eat meat, so I wouldn't even know. Oh, what do you have? Yeah. Like the shrimp cocktail or something? I eat fish, yeah. Yeah. So. I went in there one night and ordered the shrimp, Tom, and came home with the crabs. It was a rough night. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Yeah. Now, let I'm me ask. Up front with I know why you're going to Craig's because. So, Craig's is a celebrity spot. You could go to any fucking I place. Getty images. I get Getty images when I get it, to go there. Exactly. You That's why you I'm go there. Doing. The food's not that great. You know I've been there. Doesn't, doesn't matter. <laughs> I could be serving you Little Caesar's pizza and you'd pay 200 bucks for they it. They serve me pigs in a blanket. I'm happy. Just take the fucking Getty image. Let's go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and all the paparazzi are, are there. You know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do they come food isn't the- bad. No, it's not bad, but... Uh, do they recognize you when you walk into Craig's? Do they take your picture? Well, I'll, I'll leave it to you like this. About a year and a half ago, you know, I would go in a little bit when I went to L.A. once a year. And uh, I would always say hello to the owner and just keep walking. Now he talks to me, knows me. Greg, that's the owner. Yeah. And Patty, Patty started to vibe me when my hotel called and said, this is a, a, a very good client that's been staying with us 20 years. He's a really nice guy. And when, when Jim Little said that, at the peninsula, everything changed when I go in there. I get the booth and I start getting vibe there. At the Beverly Hills Hotel, they actually have a machine that puts your picture on the cappuccino. I've had that done twice. So there's a lot going on. Uh, we're very friendly with Mr. Pink, Richard Pink, and we do promotional events when we do our shoots. And he comes out, buys us lunch, and he texts me how much he loves me and how nice time he put it. He put a second fan picture of me up, and he he, he brought out the Jersey Outlaw hot dog. So I got a lot of love out there for sure from, uh, people in the California, and that's and that's time what makes me feel good. Not prepping a tooth for a crown. <laughs> you know what I mean? No one's clapping when you're done. Cool. No one cares. No, they're, they're going, Doc, you know, when I, I spent a G note, it bites high. Can you fix it? Or they're complaining. And I'm like, I just can't sit and numb you and do this anymore. This is, and I'm good at it. And then yeah. goes, same Doc, you're tired of this because your work's like gorgeous. That's the sad part. That That's what kills me inside is that the work's nice and customers love me. They want me. Of course. But you know what? I got to get my, I got a nice associate works there and I got to get Blake in there so I can get the hell out. So let me ask you this, right? So what's more satisfying going in the Craig's and having them take your picture or making someone on the street who's like a hard ass actually laugh? Oh, uh, both of them. Anything where there's a vibe. There was a lot of Jews in Beverly Hills uh, yes. Saturday night when we shot comedy because, you know, it's Rosh Hashanah. Sure. In Italian, they, they don't say it right. They call it Rosh Hashanah honey. Because Italians don't know what the holiday, but to make the long story short, there are a lot of Jews and they had their, their yarmulkes on and everything. And, you know, the Jews, the older Jews liked my jokes because it's a little bit of a Don Rickle shtick. And I fucking was killing it. And the camera guy goes, I can't stop laughing. These fucking people love you. You know, one was dressed funny. I said, trick or treats in three months, sir. Have you taken a look at yourself? And the guy's like spitting his water up. And there was a woman. An older woman, when a guy says, sir, have you taken a look? I mean, do you need glasses? I mean, what are you doing here? I got a nice young Korean brought around a quarter. It's 20 bucks. I'll, I'll handle the bill. You know, I said, I know everything's in her name. I can talk to the lawyer. I can get that done by Tuesday. I, I'll fix it. You know, so I have a way with people, but I have a way where they know I'm having fun and they're not killing me. They know it's a joke. And that's well, the beauty of what I do. That's, that's not easy to pull off. Street. That's Don Rickles. You can't, that. Pull it, you can't pull it off me. That yeah. Peter Marco guy, the clip you just watched, mm-hmm. 
No one is going to go up to this guy and do that and get away with it. Me. And the guy gave me a hug at the end. That is so a special there's a gift. certain vibe and a gift. And, and that's why, Tom, I have to carry that torch. For sure. And continue this style of comedy that no one will do. And I feel an obligation to keep it alive. Uh, you know, I just, my wife always says, you're going to get famous or get killed. That's what she tells me. <laughs> so what but, do you do, uh, like, when you do race stuff? I mean, do you get called racist or anything well, or sexist or? The problem, the problem with the black jokes is you can't do the real rough ones anymore. So of I course. stop them. And with blacks, I can do age. I can do weight. I can do education. I can't do the race ones too much. Um, I had some real good ones, but they're too rough. Um, I still can get away with Asian stereotypic jokes and Spanish stereotypic jokes and the Jews and the Italians. I have so many funny Italian jokes and they all still hit. So, but the blacks is the one area where you have to go a little, little easier. And the sure. other thing I learned with insult fat people, don't insult a fat girl, insult a fat guy because <laughs> chicks will not vibe it. They, I cannot go up to a girl who's heavy and say, honey, you have something under your chin. She says, what is it? I said, it's your other chin, but I can do it to a guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Did you so have to learn that the I, hard I way? I learned as I go. Yeah, What's that? sure. I said, did you have to learn that the hard way? I learned it by after about 12 times. If Kevin goes, why don't you just insult the fat guy? The fat girl's getting really upset. So I kind of learned that the hard way. Yeah. That's funny. But you so, learn, you know what, Tom? You learn as you go. Of course. You learn as you go in, in this. Yeah. So what's next for you, man? We talked for 50 minutes. Um, this is awesome. Like, promote yourself. What do you got so going on? We have a documentary called Just About Famous that Alex Novell's doing. And that comes out in a month. And Alex Novell is a very, very good documentary filmmaker, according to him. So we'll see when the film comes out how good it is. If it's not good, we'll actually just find a nice uh, guy. I don't know if you know Fabo Fabanici, but I make a phone call to him. And, you know, we bring a baseball bat out. We said, you fuck the film up and Fabo attack. And he gets a couple guard dogs and a baseball bat and chases him in Little Italy. But, uh, no, we have a film coming out about a documentary. But the thing nice is... There's exclusive things about me in it people don't know, so it'll be interesting. Um, and we're keeping them all quiet so when they come out in the film. Um, so that's going to be something interesting. And if we get lucky and it gets distributed well or picked up by a streaming platform, that could really help my career. Um, so, I mean, that's a big thing we have going on. And we're back, hopefully, Where can on they, the hold on, hold on. Where can they see that, though? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be, like, in theaters in certain cities? Or is it going to be... Well, we're going to do... We're gonna do we're going to do Tom a, a screening in, in, uh, in the village. Alex is going to get a theater for that. And then we're going to distribute it. And we have a guy, Brad Stein, who's helping us on distribution. So we have people on nice. the back end. And then the other upcoming thing is the H3 H3 live show in December. We're going to be out back in LA for that. That always is a big vibe. Nice. So that's the upcoming things. We're, we're doing LA like four times a year. Now we used to do it once a year and it, and, and it really works because LA is the vibe it, the sure. vibe is LA, yep. New York too, to a point, but LA is very more accessible and open. Yep. You could be sitting and talking to a guy in a restaurant who's a, a, a film producer. It's not like that in New York. There's paparazzi at places in LA. They come to New York when they're told people are there. They mm -hmm. don't just hang out at Ballas or like at Craig's. So it's a lot different and it's way more open and it's easier in LA to, to do what I want to do to get to get somewhere not new york but new york is great there's sure. nothing happening in south jersey you know <laughs> no so there's let me ask you this dying. when you give the keys to your son are you moving to beverly hills or what no i'm going to give the keys to my son and say there's no charge and i'm going to hang out a little bit and show him the ropes and then i'm going to call you tom and see if you have a an extra bedroom at your spot for me because that's my next <laughs> that's always it. Always Uncle I'm Jimmy, gonna, always your family. Uncle Jimmy. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, Tom, uh, stay with what I like doing because, you know, I'm older now and I want to do what makes me feel good. And I admire you because you left the job to do what was in your heart. And I have to tell you, Tom, the percentage of people that do that are low. I don't have the balls to leave my job for this because I'm not making money. So for you to do that, I have to admire you. Anybody that follows their, their heart. And my filmmaker, he followed his heart to become a filmmaker and go to film school. He's no money in it now. But, you know, he's he's following his heart. He said when he work, works for MTV and he does paid work, he can't stand it, but he does it to pay his bills. For sure. But he wants to be creative and, like, work on my film and do his own projects. Kind of like what you're doing, what I'm doing on the street. Same yeah, thing. For sure. 
last night, Tom, I told my son, I said, you know, take out the trash. And he said, you married or you take her out. <laughs> <laughs> I got problems, Tom. You got real I, problems. I you, got histrionic personality disorder. That's a real problem. <laughs> I got problems. I like to hang out in gay bars, you know. I always fly in the cockpit. What do you want from me? I got problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, man. It was nice hearing from Dr. Wiener today and talking to the man behind the outlaw. It'll come when out will Wednesday. We see this? Wednesday, man. So watch it Wednesday. Correct. Will you text me the link? I'll text you clips. I'll do whatever you want. If yeah. You want, if you want any parts from this interview, I provide value, Jimmy. Did you hear me before? Uh, what can I Send do some, for you? I'll give Send you clips. me some good clips. I will. Yeah, I'll put them up on Instagram. Give me a bunch of clips, like under one minute. Of, of course, yeah, I know the deal. I'm not as big as yes, you, but yes, I know how Instagram works. Hey, Tom, guess what happened last night? What? You know, my wife and I got kinky. She tied me to the bed, right? And she got dressed and left. <laughs> I got problems, Tom. Oh, I'm <laughs> mad at her too, Tom. What? I'm mad at her. Well, I came home last night about 11 and they... In the ashtray, there was a cigar. It was lit. I said to my wife, where'd that lit cigar come from? And Tom, a voice in the closet said, would you believe Havana? <laughs> yeah, I'm pissed at her, Tom. I think you'd be mad if that happened to you, too. Yeah, I would. I would absolutely. Well, thank but you, I brother. I appreciate you having me on and making the little guy feel important. That was you are nice. important. And thank you guys for I'm watching. Better than sure. and you're important. Thank, and you guys are important. So thank you for watching. Subscribe, turn on uh, notifications. Welcome. New videos every Wednesday. Live streams every Tuesday and Thursday night. So thanks, guys.